the rocket science, which kind of colloquially indicates that uh, in space science and engineering, it's a gold standard and benchmark to compare against. And who can demystify the challenges in dealing with uh, this complexity than an ISRO scientist and engineer? It's my honor to introduce you, Dr. Jean Agendra Rao, former director and distinguished scientist at ISRO's Laboratory of Electro-Optic Systems. He holds his PhD in Aerospace Engineering from Indian Institute of Science. He worked with ISRO uh, at ISRO for 36 long years from 1981 to 2017, where he uh, retired as director of the laboratory of uh, electro-optic systems. Currently, he is professor at PS University of Bengaluru. During his tenure at ISRO, he contributed to and led research, design and development of various satellite components, such as image processing of smart sensors for IRS satellites, um, digital signal processing for GSAT-1 satellite, star trackers for resource sat and CARTOSAT. He later laid development of complex electro-optical payloads for the India's Mars mission. Hello. For his contributions, he has received many awards, especially ISRO Merit Award in 2013 and Life Excellence Award by Astronomical Society of India in 2015. Title of his talk is uh, an overview of economy. Uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I missed something. Uh, pardon me for that. So, challenges in development uh, of electro-optical systems for our space missions. Uh, over to Dr. Rao. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. It's a nice uh, occasion to be here and uh, great opportunity to listen to the uh, speeches of the professors and uh, well-known uh, experts in the topic of uh, complex theory. I am from ISRO. And uh, I retired as one of the directors of uh, one of the lab laboratory for electro-optical systems. And that was a photograph uh, given at the time by Sri Manohar Parikar, uh, that was the time defense minister, and uh, gave a felicitation for uh, uh, meeting the Chandra uh, Mangalyan project at the time. And uh, though we didn't know many of uh, the complex theory that uh, was told by our previous speakers, uh, it really, the ISRO has taken up some of the complex projects, and uh, one of some of these are uh, Chandrayaan. One of the space missions is Chandrayaan mission, and uh, another one is the Mars orbital mission. And the future projects that are coming up are Chandrayaan 2, Aditya 1. These are all different space science projects apart from the regular communication and uh, remote sensing projects. Uh, morning, Santosh was mentioning about the interest of the organization. The uh, 30 meter telescope and things like that. So I thought your audience will be interested in knowing how an actual telescope is being fabricated and tested. And uh, so I have taken one of the case studies of uh, ISRO's uh, AstroSat project and uh, how we fabricated a telescope and how we launched it and then what are the complexities involved in uh, meeting the demands of the uh, what you call the scientist requirements, how we have done it, that, that kind of thing. I, I just thought we will spend it on this. So it's quite light on this, not much of a theory, but uh, you can possibly get a feel of what are the complexities that are there in the uh, a typical space mission. And this is one of the prestigious missions of uh, Indian Space Research Organization, AstroSat. It is a multi-wavelength space astronomy, and uh, it will carry out uh, uh, observations in the X-ray, optical, and ultraviolet band simultaneously. So this was the project and it was thought of by, by our uh, Professor Kasuri Rangan who was uh, himself an astronomer. So he thought the, the various organizations like Indian Star, of Astrophysics, Ayuka and so many organizations they should have an opportunity to develop instruments and then fly it on the space and uh, thereby uh, get uh, an opportunity to study the various uh, uh, celestial bodies. So these were the transient X-ray sources and so many objectives were there. This project was successfully launched in 28 September 2015 from Sierra Ricotta and uh, it was launched into one of the equatorial orbits. This is the photograph, I mean what you call computer graph of the uh, AstroSat configuration and uh, this is the main payload, ultraviolet imaging telescope. These two telescope, twin telescopes are the uh, uh, first payload. And there is also a large area X-ray proportional counter, lax PC. These were three instruments were there in this side. And there is also cadmium gene telluride uh, imager and uh, soft X-ray telescope. There is a long tube here. 
and apart from that scanning X-ray sky monitor. This is also a uh, payload which scans for the X-rays by rotating this antenna in uh, different directions. Apart from that we have these star trackers uh, in uh, different directions which will give the stability to the spacecraft in different directions. College students. Yeah. Uh, I no. Think some people some small no, no experiments on this. It is fully by professional astronomers. Uh, various institutions have participated. I have a slide on that. Uh, various institutions have participated. You were talking about the uh, what you call student experimental satellites, which are different. This is uh, entirely for professional astronomers. And uh, as you can see, the uh, AstroSat wavelength coverage is in the wavelength. This is the visible region where we look at the normal uh, colors of the spectrum, sun spectrum, or FGR kind of a thing. And uh, above this is uh, infrared, and uh, shorter than this is ultraviolet. This is the typical range. You're starting from ultraviolet onwards. I mean, of course, you, there is a, a visible band also in the UVIT. So this covers the entire band here. Other than that, this SX, SXT covers the soft X-rays, and lax spacey <coughs> covers the hard X-rays at CZTI also. And there is an SSM also which is covering this range. So there is a multi-wavelength in instruments which are situated in the same spacecraft looking at the various celestial sources. This is the uniqueness of this particular uh, satellite. So these are the basic telescopes. This twin telescope is the basically the ultraviolet imaging telescope, the Indian Institute of Astrophysics, Laboratory for Electro Optical Systems and Canadian Space Agency. And these are the ones who have developed this instrument. And uh, the field of view is uh, half a degree and 1.5 arc seconds resolution is the specifications and uh, one of the best resolutions we got it with this kind of a thing. I am going to cover in detail how this kind of a project has been executed. Remaining is a soft X-ray telescope and large area proportional, uh, proportional counter to basically discover the soft X-rays and uh, cadmium zinc telluride camera by TAFR and uh, scanning X-rays for uh, sky monitor by the uh, present uh, URSC. These are the instruments which are flown simultaneously in that uh, spacecraft. So one difficulty in developing this instrumentation was these were basically from various scientists uh, situated in the uh, premier institutions of the country, country and uh, they had no experience of uh, developing a space based instrumentation in India. So they had laboratory models but how to put a develop a model and uh, uh, fly it qualified it has to qualify for the rocket vibration and uh, it has to be surviving in the uh, space environment and uh, it has to actually transmit the data and then give it to these uh, uh, what you call scientists seat, teams which are, who are actually analyzing the data. This kind of experience turned out to be that uh, uh, a large interaction need to be uh, done with the scientists to explain what the complex electronics that are required for surviving the spacecraft uh, environment. It took us quite some time to understand, make them understand. In fact, uh, some teams were deputed to the laboratories to train them in the various uh, uh, facets of uh, developing space instrumentation. The interaction between the humans was a very complex phenomena which was uh, required to make these things. Scientists as you, you know, they are all, they're all perfectionists but the engineering always finds a via media solution or a achievable solution for solving the practical problems but uh, the, uh, the levels were not matching and a uh, lot of interaction need to be taken place. So one of the major achievements of uh, AstroSat satellite is that we have a very good understanding between the scientist community and the engineering community to deliver a product which we can be proud of. Yeah, so I take one particular case study, the first instrument, the UVIT, and uh, the what are the complexities what in the development of such a electro-optical instrumentation. So electro-optical system, if you consider it as a route, it requires basically the mechanical systems, we have the sensor, payload development, optics, lasers and thin films and detectors and apart from that embedded systems you require a lot of microprocessors, you require test facilities. The interaction of all these systems as my previous speakers told and uh, that will really, if once can qualify all this, of course you have the space environment also situated along with this. Where all these things are combined together you get a very good excellent uh, electro optical instrument. So this is the typical specifications of the UVIT optics configuration. Uh, which is basically a long telescope, it is a more than a meter focal length. I mean actually the total, total focal length is around 3 meters, but it is folded 3 times with a what you call regular RC telescope and the diameter is around 300 mm 
and the focal length is uh, around 1.5 meters or so to the uh, from the objective. So this is the specification. The difficulty is the ultraviolet light. The full ultra ultraviolet light is uh, 130 nanometers to 180 nanometers, and ultraviolet visible uh, range is uh, we have two ranges: 180 nanometers to 300 and 350 to 500 nanometers. And the resolution is one of the highest that was attempted for a space mission, around 1.2 arc seconds. And the field of view is around 0.24 plus or minus with the f of around 12.86. And then rest of the specifications are details about uh, how to uh, evaluate this uh, uh, what you call UVIT in different regions. So this is the uh, engineering of uh, an abstraction of a twin tower telescope. One is the near and visible uh, uh, ultraviolet range and other one is the far ultraviolet range telescope. And uh, so you can see the structure is around 3.1 meters. It is longer than the normal uh, satellites what we can see. And this is the metering cylinder and they have a stray light avoidance baffle because it is easy to look at the stars but the other objects which are close by should not corrupt the light. We have, so we have a long baffle that is projected out of that. And of course there are doors. This is one time operable. You after uh, completing the launch phase, the door will open up and it will uh, allow the light to fall in and uh, that is it. And basically there are two mirrors, one is called a primary mirror and a secondary mirror. These are the ones which is uh, basically the uh, one which collect the faint light that is coming from the far galaxies. So a lot of emphasis is put on the uh, what you call the quality of the mirrors that are there in the system. So this is the photograph of the five flight uh, uh, telescopes in the assembled uh, fashion. So this is in the uh, NGK Minan laboratory of uh, Indian of Astrophysics. So these are the typical specifications. This is the primary mirror. So the primary mirror is a uh, concave hyperboloid surface and the radius of curvature is this and uh, the weight of the mirror is around 12 kg and uh, the important thing is that it requires a support ring which will take care of the uh, what you call avoiding the various vibrations and various large loads that are coming into the picture. These are the specifications for the secondary mirror. So this is again diameter is around 140 mm and the mass is around 1, k, 1 kg. But the surface quality requirements of this mirror are quite high, quite stringent. So the typically the, the, this is mentioned in the comment of uh, surface figure quality at 630 nanometers. The RMS value is around lambda by 50. When wavelength is around 633, the highest surface deviation should not be more than 150th of that. That kind of an accuracy is required. And uh, so measurement has to be conforming to that. And micro roughness is also a very stringent uh, parameter and it is better than 10 angstroms or so. So this kind of a technology is very tight for realization and uh, we could successfully do it. So these are the critical areas of development, fabrication of mirrors with the high surface quality and uh, so lambda by 50 at 633 uh, nanometers, but actual operation is around 100 nanometers. So you get another factor of five here so the making such a mirror with uh, stuffed quality is very difficult and uh, micro roughness on the mirrors is again 10 nanometers. So that's also 10 angstroms, so very difficult. And of course the mounting has to be very good, it should not pass on the vibration, it should actually make the mirrors float in the space. So that is the kind of thing by isostatic mirrors. And of course characterization of the mirrors assemblies and then qualification for vibration loads and uh, putting and testing the whole thing in a vacuum, vacuum environment because the whole thing is, has to work in a deep uh, space and then characterization of the telescope at these wavelengths. I will come to this point, what is the difficulty about it? And then of course the coating of the uh, surface, this is, these are ultraviolet coatings, not these uh, regular visible aluminum kind of things. So this reflectance has to be greater than 70% for these ultraviolet uh, waves, waves. So uh, and uh, contamination and control and transportation is also a very important aspect because you may be doing very good in your laboratory but if we, something doesn't work in the final, uh, 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 what you call a lab of integration or it does not work in the space uh, after surveying through the launch environment, this is whole thing is useless. So that's the reason contamination control, there is a strict plan and it has to be done accordingly. So you can see a simple telescope, what we regularly see in uh, uh, what you call the ground system, the activities that are uh, taken up for a space telescope becomes much more complicated or almost eight times higher than what a normal system is done. So uh, coming to the optomechanical uh, design, the challenge is to provide the dimension control of the optics. 
you have uh, various uh, dimension control. Uh, basically, your uh, sunlight varies because it's not a exactly a sun synchronous orbit. The sun angle in the body changes. Always, it the sun goes around the body, and uh, so sunlight is not uh, illumination input from the sun is not always guaranteed. So you will get different thermal input to the satellite. In spite of that, one has to maintain the telescope length exactly because otherwise the telescope gets defocused and we may not be able to see the stars precisely. That is the dimension control is very important. And similarly, geometrical positioning of the optical elements and uh, to meet the pointing accuracies, you are interested in pointing to a particular galaxy, you should not, you should exactly do that, otherwise the galaxy may not be there in the field of view what you are looking for. So surface deformations, it should not be any undulations of the uh, mirrors, so this is also important. Against the manufacturing process, assembly and interface effects, static and dynamic loads, gravity release effects, thermal loads. So these are the very important aspects that you all need to be taken care when you are designing a space-based optical telescope system. So uh, typically I'll explain, with respect to uh, a mirror, would be, uh, in theory it would be a parabola or a hyperbola kind of a thing and it is mounted in a uh, what you call a gravity controlled mount and we expect the axis to be like this. This is the ideal expectation. But actually what we would possibly get after realization would be something like this. The axis of the mirror will be tilted with respect to the actual axis and the surface what is realized would not be as smooth as this but it will have an undulations over the surface and uh, uh, the what you call the tilt will be different from this. So there, there is a translation with respect to the center axis. These are all the inaccuracies that are likely to be there in the overall uh, optical system realization. Yes, sir. Uh, could you explain to the micro roughness? In yeah, micro roughness is the basically the what you call a deviation with respect to the uh, mean value of a reference surface. A reference surface, a mean value with respect to the reference surface, the RMS value, or the peak to peak, the high to the low. This is the specification. Uh, yeah, I, I told you no, that uh, RMS specification. So um, this is I would request uh, to you know have uh, the questions to, uh, at the end of the talk in the interest of time. Thank you. Yeah, so they are covered. Actually, the specifications are covered. I am explaining what it means. These are not numbers, basically. The basically to give you an analogy, the human hair is around uh, around 10 micrometers or 20 micrometers to around 200 micrometers. What we are asking is a thousand times lower than that. The roughness. Should not, it should be a one thousandth of a human hair. That is the kind of number what the mirror demands. Okay, so typical uh, optical uh, uh, mirror assembly, these are the requirements. So we have to mount it better than this lambda by 10 peak to valley and lambda by 10 RMS. So this of course is Gaussian only, but nevertheless we specify like this. And uh, the stresses should be better than uh, megapascals and uh, the displacement should be better than mm and then the lateral displacement should be better than mm, I mean 0.02 mm and uh, the tilt should be better than uh, arc seconds and the vibration of the radius should be better than 20 microseconds, microns and the natural uh, assembly frequency should be greater than 150 hertz. These are all the tight specifications of the mirror which have to be necessarily met. Otherwise, we cannot guarantee the performance of the telescope as a whole. So this is one of the uh, what you call uh, isostatic mount that is designed. So this is with a bipod and a computer aided analysis has been carried out to make sure the natural frequency is done. So our requirement was 150 hertz and we got around 450 hertz. So that kind of a stiffness is guaranteed by this system. So and the stress related uh, uh, what you call parameters are also analyzed and then made sure it doesn't cause any stress to the mirror and uh, it will survive. And uh, the next important uh, difficult task is to fabricate a mirror. The, we take a rough mirror, a, a, what we call a zero-door glass blank and then start grinding it with uh, various polishing machines and then take the various uh, uh, interferograms and then the interferogram will be very uh, rough initially but ultimately it will become like this and at every stage there are so many what you call fabrication inspection, fabrication inspection cycles and then finally we reach this kind of a lambda by 10 and lambda by 50 kind of a numbers. So the number is a Highly optimistic number, but it takes quite a long to realize a space grade mirror. And it requires a lot of infrastructure in the uh, instrumentation. Uh, we have a, 
what we call a large size uh, polisher, rubber polisher, and we have a ultra precision uh, machine which can fabricate this kind of a mirror, and a large computer controlled polishing machine for uh, this kind of a mirrors, and of course various uh, computer based instrumentation to do this. So nothing is really substitution for human intelligence because all these machines are controlled by the human uh, intelligence, human operators who will oversee the total overall production. So this is the typical interferometric setup, this is the Zygovo interferometer and uh, we are testing the mirror uh, to the see whether the surface quality is met or not. And this is the kind of thing, this is the primary mirror assembly and then uh, secondary mirror assembly. So this has been found to be perfect and we are meeting all the optical requirements that are being specified. But of course with lot of effort. The, though the mirrors are finally good, when we assembled the entire mirror assembly and then tried to see it, we found that we, have not, we are not meeting the requirements. Because what was the analysis was done and then when finally it found out that the, when the ultraviolet source is being tested in the atmosphere, the ultraviolet rays are being scattered by the even one meter distance, by distance of a very short distance also the light doesn't go properly, the scattering effect, uh, what you call, uh, produce a blur and the blur is uh, deteriorating the MTF, overall uh, modulation transformation. So that was the reason we analyzed. Then finally the a project was introduced, I mean a new project was taken up to qualify a thermovac chamber. The idea was to put the telescope inside a vacuum chamber, evacuate the entire area and then launch a ray through the source and uh, put it through a collimator and then receive at the other end. So this was thought of in the middle of the project and uh, but uh, successfully the thermovac chamber has been realized, this is a thermovac pump and ultra, -wide, ultra -wide, low uh, vacuum, ultra low vacuum was required and for minus 6 kind of a vacuum was required and you can see two collimators, one collimating, other one receiving and uh, a long chamber of uh, more than a 2 meters length was thought about it. And the trouble is when the vibration is there for the motors, when the pumps are working, you cannot really take any measurements. So the test conditions are better than 10 micrometers and 5 micrometers kind of a high accuracy was required for aligning these two telescopes, otherwise they won't uh, work. So these kind of challenges were successfully faced and uh, a, a chamber of 800 millimeters by 3.8 meters is almost 4 meters long telescope to a accuracy of 10 power minus 6 bar was uh, realized and uh, the various tests were carried out and LSF, PSF was already successfully done and the entire VTF and uh, interfaces was developed by LEOS for uh, calibrating this instrument. This is a great achievement within the project schedule. So when we measured the uh, actual uh, uh, what you call uh, LSF, line spread function, this was the 150 nanometers and uh, we could see that uh, the data was actually fitting and it is meeting the requirement correctly. So that was a great uh, achievement and we were within the specifications what was required by the uh, project. And the second thing is because we have put the bring, brought the telescope and in the thermovac chamber we could uh, test it before the uh, unit was subjected for thermovac, what kind of a performance we have got it, the red line indicates that it is before the performance and after the thermovac was done, again reflectance measurements of the ultraviolet uh, mirrors were taken and the samples have passed the test. So this was uh, meeting the requirement. So this was necessary, otherwise we, we do, would not have had a confidence that the telescope would have really worked in the space. So this was the prerequisite and uh, qualification was necessary for doing that. And uh, the last thing is once the mirrors are made and everything was qualified, the, they have to be transported to the place. From uh, laboratory of electro-optics it has to go to Institute of Astrophysics and then once that uh, transportation is completed, then it could go to ISAAC. But uh, for even for transportation, uh, some kind of a vacuum containers are built in where the mirrors are uh, suspended here in the middle and then the whole thing is evacuated and the pressure gauges were there to transport items of a uh, for maybe 30-40 kilometers, we had to build extensive instrumentation to see that the mirrors could be transported safely. So that was the kind of uh, care that was taken for uh, transportation of the uh, space quality mirrors. So with uh, after a long process of developing various uh, uh, what you call difficult processes, interactions with the scientists and all that, finally the satellite has been built. It took almost uh, 10 years. In the original intent was around 5 years but the entire satellite took almost 10 years for building it but uh, successfully it was launched, lifted off by PSLV C30 and uh, the rest of it is a history. Now the, this is one of the best satellites that was performing in the space and this was one of the typical photographs of the 
uh, UVIT. You can uh, zoom some of these areas. You can see far galaxies, farther galaxies with a extremely good clarity. We could see it. This was the, the closest telescope by launched by NASA was having around 5 microsecond, 5 arc seconds uh, accuracy, whereas we could uh, get around 2 arc seconds accuracy in space. On the ground, what was demonstrated was 1.5, but what was the obtained in the space was around 2 arc seconds. So, one of the best uh, performing telescopes, and uh, IAA, there is a continuous program for uh, utilization of this uh, AstroSat imagery. So, uh, while it is nice to make various uh, claims about the satellite performances and things like that, this reminds me uh, one incident where uh, some one of the some of the Indian scientists went for uh, a conference in U.S. and uh, there was a astrology conference and there was uh, so many other scientists also came uh, across for that and uh, uh, some American scientists and Indian scientists they were all exchanging uh, during the coffee break. So some one of the claim made by American uh, scientists was that uh, we at uh, NASA could uh, send a satellite to almost to the sun. So, how a probe can be uh, reaching the sun and others uh, were uh, wondering. But then they said, okay, no, it, it is, it is impossible to launch a satellite or a probe to the sun, uh, it, everything will get burnt out. But then uh, the other, when the other scientists have countered it, they said almost we have gone close to the uh, sun, we have sent a probe to the, what you call, uh, first uh, satellite uh, close to that. Mercury. Mercury is the satellite. Up to Mercury planet we could send the satellite and uh, we have almost reached the sun. It's only a few hundred kilometers, maybe one million kilometers, not more than that. So since we could reach up to Mercury, so that's a great achievement. The other scientists have accepted it. Then this is the turn of uh, Russian scientists. The Russian scientists told we have developed a submarine which can go up to the deeps of, depths of, uh, it can rock onto the ocean floor. We have sent, it can be sent up to the Antarctic, I mean what you call, uh, this uh, Pacific Ocean, uh, as deep as Pacific Ocean. Pacific Ocean is very deep, it's almost 11 kilometers. Nobody has gone ever below, below one, one and a half kilometer. But uh, at the time the claim was again uh, counter, I mean, for, uh, questioned by Indian scientists and uh, American scientists. Then he said almost we have gone to the uh, bottom of the ocean floor, maybe a little one kilometer away from it, but almost we have gone, five, six kilometers we have gone. So that was the second counter claim made by uh, the uh, Russian scientists. Then it was a turn of Indian scientists. So then uh, what was told was that uh, he, he wanted to teach a lesson. He said, oh yes, we have, we also have uh, done uh, a great thing. We have found a way to eat food with nose. Then other two scientists got confused. How can somebody eat with a nose? No, this is a very ancient technique. Our uh, sages have practiced it and uh, we can eat with the uh, nose. No, 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 it's not possible to eat food with nose. Something again, the other two part. Yeah, almost, it's very close, one, one centimeter only. <laughs> so, it's not a one, kilo, one million kilometers away from sun, it is not even one kilometer from uh, ocean surface, it's only one centimeter away from earth. I mean, what, one uh, mouth. <laughs> so, this kind of claims and counter claims can be there, as we have seen many theories can be there about what is uh, feasible and what is not feasible. But in science and technologies, more or less things are feasible. These uh, facts can be demonstrated, but only with a lot of uh, hard work and uh, dedication and things like that. Though we didn't know about much of theory, what uh, our professors have told today, but uh, with the one simple thing I can say is that uh, there is a lot of uh, teamwork as uh, my earlier speakers told about ants. We literally worked on uh, like an ants for the development of this uh, telescope. So we split the various complexities into sub-tasks and then that sub sub task can be split into even further uh, smaller tasks such that the simple task can be executed at one time and then there is an extensive monitoring network which followed these uh, tasks. So essentially very good project management is necessary for taking up a task, any, anything like this. So this is one important area, learning from mistakes. So the INISRO is very proud of uh, the INISRO, we are very proud of uh, the various levels of reviews that have taken place. So one is about the configuration review and the various preliminary de design review. Subsequently, after the performance, the telescope is realized, we have the critical design review. 
and then they said obviously when the processes are all taken place correctly or not that is all by a global audit review and then before the actual payload is shipped from the unit this is the pre-shipment review and uh, the, when the spacecraft is about to be launched we have the flight readiness review and uh, when the rocket to take off there is a flight authorization board review subsequent to the launch there is a flight performance review and there is an integral database of what are all the mistakes and how to correct them this kind of an integral database is also there and so the objective of the organization is entirely do it first time right so this is the quality goal of the organization and you can see this is one of the GSLV Mark III rocket that was uh, with a entirely new configuration with the two rockets on the side staff and uh, there is a cryogenic engine which is developed indigenously this was launched first time right and it went precisely to the dot so that kind of a uh, rocket launching is again a great achievement apart from the Mangalyaan etc which the previously you know the history so I would come to the summary slide so the essentially the space born electro optical payloads demand extraordinary precision in the design and development of instruments so the precision that is demanded is unheard of and uh, one can one has to take up as a challenge and then try to realize it and obviously multidisciplinary tasks or skills are required are mandatory in the development of these instruments it is not that one company or one area or one uh, uh, organization could do it but we could pool the resources of entire country various organizations have worked together their skills have been joined and uh, that's how we could rope, rope up the experts from various fields and uh, the project could be realized so this is uh, one important area and excellent planning that involves various uh, sufficient time for testing and to recover from the mistakes this is the important uh, necessity otherwise uh, we will be there will be a lot of setbacks and we will have to be uh, uh, taking time from correcting this so that is very necessary of course we have paid uh, time as a penalty but uh, that was necessary to learn this kind of thing and large infrastructure is also necessary to prove the system performance in orbit this is one many times we learned this lesson but uh, the infrastructure requirements have, cannot be relaxed and many levels of reviews also help to achieve the project goals in the given schedule and doing first time right is a quality culture necessary for realization of the large complex projects so these are the important uh, summaries that i could figure out uh, from the uh, in what you call making a uh, presentation for this uh, so lastly thanks to harshal for inviting me for this uh, activity and ms jaya for coordinating and uh, thoughtbox management for uh, giving me an excellent opportunity for interacting with you and i have been a student all throughout the day and learning from the complex projects and uh, I had to thank my project deputy project director Krishnamurthy who has actually a mechanical engineer and who has done an excellent work on uh, realizing the AstroSat project and uh, Mr. R. Venkateshwaran, group director of Optic, Electro Optics for the realization of this telescope and Dr. Sita, she is the science lead in uh, URSC center and former director of the space uh, sciences directory at ISRO she is the one who has uh, heralded this uh, AstroSat project and uh, Dr. Sam Serao, he is the director of the uh, what is called Center for Research and uh, Innovation, so in PES University where I am working. I thank all the management here and uh, all the history. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, personally, I have always been, uh, always been curious, you know, how this works because it is, you know, complex systems engineering and how, you know, it, it is possible to, to do it uh, uh, you know, mission after mission, uh, launching satellites and uh, uh, doing research and everything. It is a fantastic, uh, you know, glimpse into how, you know, uh, the electro optics payloads are designed and how, you know, the ISRO engineering works. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. Uh, now I request uh, Dr. Anapurni from Indian Institute of Astrophysics uh, to come and felicitate uh, Dr. Rao.